뭐잘 들리나요? 잘 들리면 예. 예, 감사합니다. 1분 정도, 정도 후에 시작하도록 할게요. I'm gonna start after one minute. 오케이, okay, so let's start today. Okay. So, you know, what we're going to cover today is something called the tra transition semantics, in, I mean, which appears in the chapter six of the textbook. A more traditional name for this part is something called small step operational semantics. And then my understanding is that some of you who took undergrad programming language course at KAIST. I mean, you are exposed to something called big step operation semantics. So that's what you learned before, and small step operational semantics is something that's pretty similar to something called big step operation semantics, but it focuses more on what's really happening in each step of the company. Okay, so what's the motivation for, and let me start with the motivation or big picture. So we studied various programming languages and so, and then we're gonna study a bit more complicated programming languages or more powerful programming languages later. And then the, one of the basic tools that we developed to study these programming languages is something called the denotation semantics. And why did we do it? I mean, the whole purpose of this course and, whole, and a large part of the research in programming languages is to analyze the many design decisions and 
of existing programming languages mathematically. And denotational semantics provides a baseline. I mean, it gives some very basic tools that let us translate programs into some mathematical interface. But, I mean, perhaps, I mean, you felt that while you are learning denotational semantics, you thought it may be too hard. I mean, it's a, sometimes it's quite complex and it exposes some existing mathematical structure, but sometimes it's too hard. And especially if our programming language has many, I mean, what's the I mean, plus side of these things is so rigorous. And then it also reveals mathematical structure behind programming languages and what programming languages design. But my last slide is that it's too difficult or too complex, especially when programming language becomes complex. And then it also sometimes we want to describe what's really happening in the middle of the computation. Sometimes people say, we want to care more about intentional properties of the program. So during the computation, what's really going on? In the, I mean, how, how many steps does it take? How many? How much memory does it use, and so on? So denotational semantics, I mean, is designed to not to address these kind of things because it tries to focus more on the abstract view of our programs from very, in which abstract away all the implementation details. But sometimes we care about the what's really going on in the middle of the computation. So it doesn't. Say much. About intermediate steps. And this kind of things becomes important, especially when you want to design analyze performance of a program. Also, at the same time, want to design either compiler or interpreter of such a programming language. So, alternative of denotational semantics, which is used quite often, is something called operational semantics. And this, uh, I mean, in the textbook, it's called transition semantics. And this is semantics is, I mean, in a very high level, it, this is semantics can be understood as some very simple abstract. By simple, I mean compared to the implementation. It's a simple abstract implementation of an interpreter of the, of the language. So, I mean, one way to specify what program means is to provide, a, I mean, reference implementation of an interpreter. If you are, I mean, have a, some doubts about the meaning of a program, you just run the interpreter. The interpreter will tell you what the meaning of a program should be. And in some sense, operational semantics follows that idea, except that instead of writing, giving an interpreter in like, maybe in Python or OCaml or Scholar, you, we provide the interpreter in a very abstract way. Okay. So it's still, I mean, so it's still mathematically rigorous, but it, it does not really try to connect those many interesting structures existing in a programming language in, with uh, uh, yeah, interesting mathematical structures in the programming language. I think I said, only very abstract words. So the best way to understand the different flavor of denotational and operational semantics is actually look at the example. Let's try to think about the example, which say x is three, y is x plus four. And then you think about some example programs like this. And when we define the meaning of this program, we use a pro I mean, denotational semantics, which maps, which say this is defines a mapping from 
state sigma, I mean, the very simple programming language is a sigma bottom. Okay. How it's defined? We said if we're given a state, sigma, we return a new state where the value of x gets updated by the semantics of this expression 3, which is equal to 3. And then value of y gets updated by, I mean, the meaning of x plus 4 on after the first execution, that's going to be 7. So this is how we define. And so you can see that it described the meaning of a program as a sing in a program transform, I mean, state transformer from input state to the output state. In operational semantics, it take a different view. It said that it tried to describe, especially the small step operational semantics, it tried to describe what kind of computation is really happening here. So for the same program, in the operational semantics, we will look at, we first form so-called uh, configuration, which is a description about a, of a machine which contains this program. Okay? So our machine contains this command. And then we also contain the state sigma. And this type of things, although I describe it abstractly, it appears in in the real world scenario quite often. If you perhaps learn an architecture course, then you, you learn that in the assembly language, there is a, I mean, the store, which is values of the registers, I mean, and the memory. At the same time, one of the registers towards program counter. So this guy correspond to so-called program counter, which describe what kind of command should be run next and so on. And then this sigma describes the value of other registers and, and, and the computer memory. Okay, so this is the configuration, but it's a kind of abstract way of describing a state to server machine. And then in operational semantics, we describe the execution of the machine, I mean, by, trend, by a transformation of this type of configuration. If you run this program, and it is described by so-called, this is called transition relation, If you run this program, the program, the first things we're gonna run is this assignment x becomes three. So after running this command, we will have the variable. I mean, this is still the remaining command, which is assigning x plus four to y. And then state will be updated after the, by, I mean, according to this, this assignment, which is the value of x is now going to be three. So that's your first step. And then the, the so it, the small step operational semantics describe only one step of the computation. And then, so we can still apply this one step again in this case, because our command is not finished. So if you apply it again, we will end up, so this part will be done, and then there will be no more states that's left. So we have a new state, sigma, x gets three, but then the value of y, will get updated by x plus three, which is going to be seven here. So that's the same as sigma x three and y seven. So as you can see, it's describing what's really happening in each step of the computation. And ultimately the denotational semantics and then operational small step operational semantics that I'm describing in terms of input output relationship, they say the same thing. So in the denotational semantics, it say that sigma gets transformed to, to this state. I think I should be like this. And then in operational semantics, it also says sigma gets transformed to this state, which is exactly the same. And that should be the case because they are describing the meaning of the same program. But Operational semantics is, in a sense, ex exposed what's really happening during the middle of the computation. So for instance, if we run program, which exactly the same, but in the middle, it has a one more step called the skip. And then y becomes x plus four. 
and then one is sigma. Then the denot from, the, from the perspective of denotational semantics, the command that I wrote here, and then the command that I'm, I'm written on the top, they will have the same denotation. From the input-output relationship, they define exactly the same input-output relationship. However, for operational semantics, they are different because the one below will take three steps. So we transform certain things, another things, the three step, the first corresponding to x becomes three, second step execute command skip, which doesn't do anything, but it's still a one step of the computation. The third one will run y is equal to x plus four. The final outcome will be the same, the sigma So it's a sigma three or seven. So the final outcome is the same, but from the, if you really compare what kind of execution step that really happened, the small step operational semantics in a sense distinguish these two commands. The one command has a two step, the, the third command has a three step. So it reveals more information and it's more suitable for as a, in a sense, blueprint of uh, implementation of interpreter or runtime system, because it really describes what really should happen in each step of the computation. How, as I define soon, all things are very rigorous. So some, there are big theories about programming languages that built on top of operational semantics. Some people use it to justify compile optimization, and then they, some people use it to build automatic verification tools. But it has a very different flavor. I mean, it's much more, in a sense, complex and compared to the denotations and when you use it, okay. Okay, so that's the big overview. So denot operational semantics, try to describe the each step of the computation, especially small step operational semantics, attempt to describe what's really happening in each step of the computation in an abstract way. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is I will show you generic recipe for defining small step or operational semantics or transition semantics by, I mean, the, by, by Reynolds. And, and then I will instantiate this general recipe to three programming languages, which are which what we covered in this course. Okay, so what is a general recipe? So general recipe for defining things, I will call it small step semantics, or it's called the transition semantics. So general recipe is we have to define, essentially what we have to do is we have to define this relation. Yes, so that the what typical terminal, I mean, traditional terminology is a small step operational semantics, but I think John Raynor just somehow called it transition semantics. It's called tra not transitional semantics, I think it's just called transition semantics. So what's the recipe? The recipe is defining a relation that formalize the I mean. So the goal is to define what I write an arrow, which is a relation that describe what happens in a single step of computation. single computation step. So how to define this? So they, we, the way we define this is I mean, we follow two steps. The first we, first, we identify something called configurations. So you can say define the set of configuration. That's the first things we are doing. So this set is called the gamma. And then the gamma 
mint. So the typical element of gamma looks like this, the one that you see here. So the gamma consists of two parts, essentially. The one is about computer memory, which is corresponding sigma. The other corresponds to the current program that we are supposed to run. Sometimes some people call this current program as a continuation because that's something that needs to be executed from this moment on. And it also corresponds to program counter that I mentioned to you before. And the, this set this is a set of configuration gamma that's essentially a set of something like the one you see above. It consists of two parts. It's a disjoint union of two parts. So gamma of n union gamma means t yes, gamma of t. So this gamma of n, they are disjoint. Okay, so these are the two. So gamma can be partitioned. In the picture, this is a gamma, can be partitioned into two parts. So gamma of n and gamma of t. And what gamma of n describes is it's a configuration describing unfinished computation. Okay. It's a configuration for incomplete computations. And then this, these are the configuration that's a completed compu uh, computation. Configuration for completed computations. And then after once, so this is a bit like, I mean, this step is a bit like setting up the form of interpretation in a denotation of semantics. We are really defining the very big frames or very big pictures of the operational semantics. So we first identify configuration. The second thing we have to do is define this binary relation that I told you in this relation here. And then, but this relation is defined. So we define, this is called transition relation. So maybe that's why John called the semantics as an uh, transition semantics. Transition relation, this uh, arrow, which is a relation between un unfinished uh, configurations to just normal configuration. Okay. So binary relation, so it relates unfinished configuration, which is typically written as a gamma. I mean, so configurations will be written as a gamma. So this one relates things like this. And then the, this, the first gamma is, is, an, is an unfinished. And then the second gamma prime is, can be a I mean, complete, completed or finished computation. I mean, describe finished computation or maybe describing some computation that, which have more steps to go. And typically, instead of writing, I mean, this is more like mathematical notation that I wrote here. But typically, instead of this, we write notation like this to really, and because this make it more clear that we, this arrow is a relation that describe a computation and computation proceed from gamma to gamma prime. So typically, I mean, once in most of the cases, once you set these configurations and then this set the basic forms of what you really want to encode, these transition relations, then actual definition of transition relation comes almost automatically. And later we will see that sometimes instead of these binary relations, we, we change it so that it's not necessary binary relation, but it can be something more complex. So it's a sometimes called a labeled binary relation. So this is something that we will soon see soon. So it's written like this to mean that 
gamma lambda gamma prime is in the arrow. So what this describes is that computation proceed from gamma to gamma prime and in the middle, some kind of output happens. Right? Some output or input or some interaction really happens. Okay. So that, that's just some more modified version. Okay. But the big things to do is the first define what kind of configurations we are dealing with. And then second, we are defining the form of transition relation and then actually the definition of that transition relation. Okay, so these are, these are two, in a sense, two steps of defining small step operational semantics. And let's instantiate this for few programming languages that we studied before. And we're gonna use the same recipe when we study lambda calculus and functional languages later. Okay, so let's apply this to the simple programming language, simple imperative programming language that we studied before. And this is the programming language that's containing Y. So it's a command. The cases were, I mean, like uh, skip. Uh, So it has a skip or as an assignment. Integer expression. And sequencing and if then else y loops. So it's a Boolean expression. So it's just some simple language that we looked at over and over again. And then for this language, we studied denotational semantics, but we're gonna look at its operational semantics. So then we follow the recipe. The recipe tells us we first have to identify configurations. So what should we put as a configuration? And then, so the step one is that we have to define what's going to be gamma n. So we also have to define what should be gamma t, so terminal configurations. Yeah, sorry, I think the official terminology is configuration in gamma t is a terminal configuration, gamma n is non-terminal configurations. Okay. okay, this gamma n, gamma t, so that's what we have to do. But for, for this language, we are saying I mean, the intuitively what gamma n should describe is a status of a machine, the memory of the machine. At the same time, it has to describe what kind of commands we have to, I mean, we still have to run. So the definition that we are giving is exactly mirrors this intuition. So we said this gamma n consists of set of command and set of states, so sigma, is a state, which is a variable to integers. So it's really, this, this is something that we used before. So it's just a pair, which take a command and a state. And this command describe which command to we should run I mean, from now on. And the sigma describe what's the memory of the machine. And gamma t describe this it's a terminal configuration, which means it's a it's an outcome of completed computation. And in this case, we just say gamma t is equal to sigma. And because after when computation is finished, what we are gonna get is the is just a state. So that's what we have here. And then now we have to define the binary relation. And binary relation is between non-terminal configuration to arbitrary configuration. So then gamma is, as I said, it's defined by n union gamma t. Okay, now how you do it. And our intuition here is that this arrow should describe a single step of the computation. So let me just start with a few and then maybe I'll ask you to complete the rest. So, so think about one of the case, which is we have a skip together with state sigma. 
And then after one step, so we're gonna define this using this uh, inference rule notation that you see in a whole logic. So if you have a skip and sigma, if you run one step, skip doesn't do anything. And then after running skip, there's nothing to be left to done. So the outcome is terminal configuration, which contains sigma, which contains only state sigma. Okay. And then now for the so, and then there we have some similar rule for assignment. So I want to do this, but after I describe, so this is something that can be described. And then we, our language also have a sequential composition. And then, so now one, if we have a sequential composition, then our intuition is that we first run C1 and one step. If C1 is done, then we move on to C2. Otherwise, we continue to run C1. So that's our intuition. So and then this rule formalizes this intuition. We say that first run C1. If C1 is done, so then we end up with terminal configuration with the state sigma prime. And then what now what we have to, to the, what we have to return is non-terminal configuration, which say from now on we have to run C2, and then the state of a machine is a sigma prime. But there is another case where the state I mean C1, C2. C1 may not be finished. It might not be finished in a single step. So it will return C1 prime and sigma prime. So there are still some more computation to be done for C1 prime. In this case, we form C1 prime and C2 and then run it under the sigma prime. Okay? Because that's what, what we are, I mean, have to run. If there is some leftover computation from C1, which is described by C1 prime, C2 haven't been started at all. So then C1 prime followed by C2 is the one that we have to run after the single step. And we have to do it in under the new, newly obtained state sigma prime. And I want you to define the semantics of if then else. So if then else actually have a two rules, one corresponding to going to the true branch, the other corresponding to going to the false branch. So I want you to do this. And then the last bit of the, I mean, the, the only left over, the one more thing that we have to do is the while loop. So if you remember what we did for the while loop in denotation and semantic, it was quite complex. We have, we have to define essentially the domain theory and have to define the semantics of a while loop as a fixed point. That was quite complex. But in operational semantics, it's really easy. So we do case analysis. If Boolean condition B is true under the current state sigma, okay? So then we have to go in, into the loop. If you go into the loops, what we have to run is a command C. And when command C is finished, we have to run this the while loop again. So if Boolean condition B is true, uh, let me write it like this. B sigma true. So if that's the case, then we unroll the loop. We go into the loop and then after the loop body is finished, we have to run the program, the, the loop again. Okay, so that's the, the case where we enter the loop. And there's another case 
which describe we don't enter the loop. So sigma is false. C sigma. And then in this case, what we do is that we just finish the loop with a current state. So we just return sigma. And so that's the transition relation for the while. Now, what well, the exercise I want to do is there are three unfinished business. So this guy for assignment, if that two, if then else. So I'll give you two minutes to finish uh, all these three. Okay, so let me show the answer. And they are all very simple. So the first step is, I mean, we, we update according to the assignment. So then after the running assignment, there's nothing to be done. So the outcome is terminal configuration, which contains sigma, where we have a, the value of the variable x is updated by according to the assignment. So, and then for if then else, we said we look at the loop condition, the, the condition of if then else, if it's true. So then we enter the loop, uh, enter the true branch, C1 with current state sigma, if, Uh, condition of condi this, if the else is false, then we go to the false branch with the current state sigma. Okay, so that's the operational semantics of this language. I mean, in the textbook, it also talk about operational semantics for I mean variable declaration, which I will omit. But I hope I mean if you are interested and want to know about it, then just have a look at the textbook. It actually involves some tricks, which, but, uh, which is worth knowing. Okay, so this is an operational semantics which describe a single step. And then what can we do with this? And we can do many things, but here we will, I will show you some, some analysis or mathematical analysis of, of this uh, this small step operational semantics. Uh, by the way, this small step operational semantics is really very closely related to implementation of an interpreter. So if you are familiar with Scheme or Scala or OCaml, Haskell, some language that supports pattern match, you can almost literally translate 
this uh, definition of operational semantics into an execution engine, which take a non-terminal configuration and return another configuration, according which implemented this small step, single step computation. Okay, so and first, if we just describe a single step computation. So if we care about running program many, many steps, so we actually we have to take this uh, reflexible transitive closure. So that means we are composing this relation n times, where n is equal to zero to uh, finitely many times. So, so that, that describes what's gonna happen in the computation in one, one step, two steps, three steps, and so on. So that's the, that this, I mean, really describing the computations from, I mean, not a single step computation, but multi-step computation. And that's what we often care about. And then we also can analyze the behavior of this operational semantics that reveals the property of this language. So the one behavior of this language, I said this uh, is that this relation, transition relation that I just defined is actually deterministic. What does this mean? This means that given us a non-terminal configuration, if non-terminal configuration goes to gamma prime, and also non-terminal configuration goes to gamma double prime by this relation, so then gamma prime and gamma double prime are the same. But this means that this programming language doesn't have any non-deterministic choice inside the program, I mean, in, in the program. So if, for instance, we include, say, random choice in the language, this property is not going to be true. So this is a property of a programming language that can be looked at by from this operational semantics. And the second property is, this has a progress property. This means that uh, for every gamma in non-terminal, there exists gamma prime such that gamma goes to gamma prime. Okay. So that means any non-terminal, we can make a progress, we can run it and you know, at least one step. And this property is also not always true in any programming languages. So some programming language may have a, some I mean, case where some non-terminal gets stuck and then doesn't can cannot make any progress, but it, it, it this lang in specific this language satisfies this progress property. And what these two implies is that this I mean number one has actually a very interesting. I mean number one has something that you are intuitively expecting, which say the following. Suppose for each uh, gamma in which is the configuration, we want to define yeah. for each gamma, if these two rules, the, the, the property in number two tells us if we keep running gamma, okay, starting from gamma, we have a gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and so on. One possibility is that we go on forever so this is an infinite, always, because I mean, determin determinism tells us there's no ambiguity starting from gamma, we go on forever. So that's a possibility one. So possibility one. And then possibility two, is that if we keep running from gamma, we get gamma one, gamma two, and so on. But at some point we are, fin we are done gamma n, that's a terminal configuration. Okay, if it's, and we are done, we can't really make progress, but then this progress property tells us the only possible way of getting finished or getting stuck is by reaching the terminal configuration. So there are two possibilities from any gamma, 
either the computation is this relation go on forever but so we can generate this infinite sequence by this transition relation or by this transition relation we reach some terminal configuration gamma n okay so that's unambiguously determined because of this determinism property so so then that means for using this gamma And so, I mean, in this case, just like I told you, this gamma is reached by gamma n. So just using these two property from the gamma, we can define some, I mean, we read actually in the textbook, in the first case, we, uh, I think John denote this by this notation, which is up arrow, something like this up arrow, but for, but well, by looking at this, we can define a function that take gamma and either return bottom if the first case, which is the small step executions go on forever, or you return gamma n, which is going to be a state, okay? because it's a terminal configuration. It's a terminal configuration, so that's going to be a state. So note that I didn't mention anything about denotational semantics. I just defined the small step or transition semantics. And then from that transition semantics, we analyze that transition semantics is deterministic and progress property from based on this, we define this capital function f. But this capital function f, I mean, if you look at this gamma, gamma is going to be some command c and state initial state sigma. And this capital function f, a bit like the denotational semantics we talked about, it takes command and it takes initial state, either it return bottom or some terminating state sigma, final state sigma prime. So that you may ask, is there any relationship between data what we get here and the denotational semantics that we talk about? It turns out they are the same. So for every command, maybe I write it. So for C is a command, and then sigma is a state, then what we have is that this is C, sigma is the same as what we get from this operational semantics. So the operational semantics and denotational semantics correspond to each other. I haven't proved this, but uh, proving this is, is, I mean, it's not very easy, but I think it's a good exercise to try. Okay. So the, what I'm showing you now is that we, although we describe only one step of the computation, we can describe a multiple step by defining this uh, transitive reflexive transitive closure. And then by analyzing this small single step relation, transition relation, we can define operator like F that really evaluates the configuration all the way until the end. And once we have it, then we can compare, we can I mean, look at what, what is the relationship with the denotation of semantics? In this case, they are the same. I mean, as you should. Okay. okay, so that's the the analysis of this simple language. And if you follow the, this transition relation, then the example that I showed you before actually may, can be computed by these, this relation, this uh, transition relation. So what we're gonna do now is that we will extend this language. Okay. So in two ways, the extension number one is to include uh, fail. So then the cement, the, if you remember the, the fail, what it does is that it stops computation at this point. And then once you stop it, I mean, the rest of the computation doesn't really proceed. 
Okay, in the absence of this new variable declaration, really fail means we stop the computation now and return the current state as an output state. Okay. So at that time, in the, when we studied the denotational semantics, like a few, few weeks ago, when we studied denotational semantics with, for the language, including fail, we looked at what we call the sigma hat. That's a uh, states, the two that have a uh, two possibility is either normal states or it's a, I mean, it's a state which have an abort, which describe the aborted computation. So, I mean, although we learn it in a more complicated context, so this fail in the denotation of semantics, if we give us some current state sigma, the failed executions, what it does is that it return the current state, but it return with the abort. And another thing that we looked at before is that if we have a fail in some command C and run is sigma, and then the, the first is going to be say, sigma and this. There is sigma that is selected abort sigma. But in the case of abort, what we learn is that it's essentially cancel everything that follows, so it just returns abort sigma. Because that's the meaning of fail. We stop the computation now, and the current state is going to be the final state. So the question becomes how we can I mean, incorporate this idea into the programming language. And we follow the same recipe. We say that recipe tells us we have to identify the set of configuration. And the set of configuration is set of non-terminals, union set of terminal configuration, non-terminal configurations, and set of non-terminal configurations. And a terminal, non-terminal and terminal configuration. And for terminal, for this language, we don't change set of non-terminal configuration. It's not changed. For set of terminal configuration, we change it because there are two types of possible endings. One is normal ending with a normal state. The other is that abnormal ending by fail or by abort. So for this, Terminal configuration, instead of setting just a set of states, we include, I mean, this aborted or failed states. Like this. And our intention is that we're going to use this part whenever we encounter failure in a program. So now how should we extend uh, our semantics? They did know our transition relation. So what I will do is that I will write it red and then update the transition relation that we wrote. So our relation is actually very similar to the one So what you did, but we have to change a little bit first. So the first change is we have to talk about what, what happens with the fail, okay? Because I mean, that's a new language construct that we included. And the second, we whenever we have a rules, which uses premise. So we have rules of this form, which I mean, you can view this as the rule that make a recursive call. And whenever the rule make this recursive call for with respect to this relation again, so then we we now have to include one more case because the, previously we only considered the case of non-terminal and then terminal configuration with the states, but not this newly added aborted uh, terminal configuration. So add one more case. 
Now these are the changes that we have to do. Okay, so let's implement these changes by going to this, these operational semantics rules. So then what should we do? So we have first have to include a rule for fail. We have a fail and sigma. The output should be an abort and sigma. So that's the change that we are making. And then now if you look at the rules where we make a recursive code, there are two, I mean, this, I mean there are these two rules that about the sequential composition. And then these rules are prepared for non-terminal configuration outputs and also as terminal configuration with the normal terminating states, but not terminal configuration with abnormal terminating state. So we have to add one more rule. Okay, so then the newly added rules is going to be look like this. We have a sequential composition. And then set if C1 abort with a sigma. So then we said the entire sequential composition should also abort. These are the two changes we are making. And in some sense, these are the main changes that's in a sense induced by including the fail. First, we are, we are defining the, the meaning of the fail. And the, the, what fail does is that it stops all the rest of the computation. And then that's incorporated by, I mean, this, uh, this uh, new rules that we add for the sequential composition. So these are the, so Follow the same recipe, and then the general skeleton is almost maintained, except that we are adding these two, I mean, two rules to account for abnormal termination. And this is, in some sense, not very surprising because the language itself is not doesn't really change that much. Okay, so that's why the semantics remains. I mean, we, we can we are able to reuse most of the rules from the for the semantics of the existing language. So well, that's our first change. The second change that we want to do so we, right, the second change we want to do is an extension. which is include input and output. So in terms of the syntax of, I mean, this is the denotational semantics of a language with input and output uses quite complex in the domain, which sometimes called resumption domain. That's is a solution of recursive domain equation. I mean, so, so it uses something quite complex and uh, in the, so that means we need to do make some non-trivial change into the denotational semantics uh, into this operation small step operational semantics that we are dealing with now. And I mean, before uh, actually making a change, let's I mean, let me remind you of the language with input and output. It's a language that has a command. So that includes everything that we talk about, including fail. But now it has inputs, so which take us some variable, the value from the user, and then assign it to the variable x. And I think here the right notation is bar. And we also have an output, which output some value of integer expression. Okay, so then the, our recipes are a bit similar. Sorry about this. So our recipe, sorry. Sorry about this. 
Okay, so so they have to make a change. So we have to, have to change the set of configuration, and then actually the set of configuration doesn't change in this case at all. So we have exactly the same set of non-terminal and gamma t. I mean, both of them are same as extension three. And then, but the transition relation is changing. And then the transition relation is now is more complex. So transition relation is because we want to talk about input and output, it's going to be a ternary relation. So it will have a non-terminal. And then you will have a, some label called lambda. And then it has possibly terminal or non-terminal configuration gamma. But then the label, we have a three kinds of labels. One is epsilon, that means nothing really happens. And then some other labels are for the inputs. So I mean output from the for any integer, and then some other labels are for the inputs for any integer. So typical I mean the transition relation may look like this. We have uh, some gamma, and if there is no input or output, there will be epsilon and gamma prime. There is an input the, from the user, then it will have a bank, say, three gamma prime. There is an output, oh, no, that's an output, sorry. If you want the user give an input, like four, then we have uh, some relation like this. So, so based on this understanding, so this is, we, we're gonna describe the computation using this ternary relation, which relates in, initial the input non-terminal configuration to output configuration gamma prime. In the process, we will put our label, that label describe there was an input or output or nothing. Yeah. And that's described by epsilon or bangs or question mark. Okay, so how do we make this change? So we make this change for the rules that we have here. So just like before, let us start with, uh, yeah. let us start with some new things that we added here. New thing that we added is the input and output. So we have uh, the, input commands, which is question mark variable x. So this is a new non-terminal configuration described where the current command is an input. And there is a new uh, non-terminal configuration where the current command is an output. So actually, I can't really write it like this. So things are more complex. So how should we write this? And then let me write for the inputs. So for the inputs, I mean, we say that this, this maybe make you a bit uh, uneasy because typically you think that what's given as an initial uh, what's given as a non given non terminal configuration is all we have, and the rest of this relation is produced by your computation. That's not the case here. To for I mean the input is something that will be provided by the user. So this arrow, the label above the arrow, is not only about what's going to be produced by the computation, but what will also be given as an input from the user during the computation. So in this case, we said if user give us give me uh, if a user gives me the input value, say n, then 
after one step of the computation, this computation will be finished. And then the output state with sigma, where the value of x gets updated with n. And then now I will give, let me, and then all the rules will be changed. And then most of the time, the, the rule said, if the rule doesn't involve any input output, we just put epsilon. Okay. So the failure that doesn't involve any input and output. So the, as far as input output is concerned, there's nothing, so we put epsilon. Skip is the same. Assignment is the same. While rule is the same. And if then else is the same, it doesn't involve any input and outputs. Y rules also doesn't involve any input and output. So we put those cases as an epsilon. And then abort and now for what remains is that root for the sequential composition. Which are the rules which make a recursive call? Okay, so these are the ones that we have to be more careful. And also there is a rule for outputs. So I will give you maybe two minutes to change these rules so that it works for, I mean, this, I mean, for, for this new language, for this new operational semantics. So two minutes, change is not very substantial, but try to change these rules. Okay, so I, the answer is actually quite easy. So let me start with the, uh, the output. For the output, we put, I mean, describe the transition relation, but for this transition relation has to produce the value, output value, which is going to be value of this output expression E on the current state sigma. And then the output, the final state is just remains the, the same as the input state. Yeah. And then for all these three cases, for, for the sequential composition, what we do, what this sequential composition has to do is that it should be prepared for the computation where that this C1 produces something, okay? That the, the first command C1 in sequential composition, if it produces something as an in, uh, input or output, we should, just preserve that input or output. And the, tip, the way we do it is we said, we put lambda, which means that if C1 finishes with the sigma prime and produces something which is in lambda, then we have to 
the entire thing will also have to produce the same input or same output. But maybe it does, it's, it's just epsilon. But it should propagate this input output epsilon from the subcommand C1 to the entire command. And that's the same for the other two cases. So I just put lambda there and lambda there. And then that's going to be the operate the small step operation of semantics for this language, which is uh, which contains the input and output. So if you, I mean, it's a bit more complex than the one that we started for, for the simple imperative language. But if you see the, I mean, compare this with the denotation of semantics, I mean, you can see this is much, much, much simpler, doesn't involve any like denot the isomorphism between two domains and so on. So uh, in practice, people often, when, when people deal with a complicated programming language, this type of small step operation mathematics is used quite often. So let me just mention one thing and then I will, let me finish, I will finish. The last bit I want to talk about is for this extension too. And for typical computation in this extension, we look like this. We start with the configuration gamma, and then we will usually have uh, some transitions which doesn't involve input and output. So one, epsilon two, I mean, all of them are just epsilon, not epsilon one. Gamma two. But sometimes we will produce an input or output. So maybe take an input three, so gamma three. And again, epsilon four, epsilon five. But then this time we pro produce uh, it's alpha three, input four, six, and epsilon maybe finish. State like this, sigma prime. And so this is the, if you keep applying this transition relation, this is the kind of thing that we obtain. And this is a close, and the denotation of semantics is in, of this language that we studied before is actually can be understood as, an, as something that we obtain from this type of sequence by only focusing on uh, some, some step, observable step, which is this output step and input step and final state. Okay. So in the denotation of semantics, and the same kind of things is described, I mean, if it's, it's described like this, this entire computation correspond to some element in omega in denotation of semantics. And the omega look is describing like this. Uh, so it's actually not quite. So let me just say a bit more. So then there are input like a question mark four, maybe some other input is five, maybe prime six, sigma double prime. And then all other inputs, it does the same. It says six prime, sigma double prime. Okay. And then in denotational semantics, it's really about focusing on these observable steps in the computation and compress all the other intermediate steps labeled with epsilon. So in, if we, I mean, there are some formal description about what, and what I'm just describing to you now in the textbook. And if you follow the formal description, there is just some map that maps these computations of the, of this small step operational semantics to an elements omega in the denotation of semantics that we described before. And for, for this type of figures, that omega looks like this. It has a output. First thing it does is it outputs three. And then it inputs. So that three correspond to this guy. And then it takes an input. And then for input, we have to define a function. And then the function set, I mean, given an input n, essentially with the case analysis, if input n is equal to four, 
that correspond to this case, I'll put this sigma prime. Otherwise, here I'll put this sigma double prime. So that is uh, what we get in the denotation of semantics. And then I mean the point I'm making is that what denotation of semantics does here is to compress all the intermediates that only shows what in a sense matters to the to, to the user, and what's the object, the, the only observable step of the computation. Okay, so that's it for today. And I'm gonna stay here about five more minutes if you have any questions. And uh, on Wednesday, we will move on to the next topic, which is uh, category theory and the solution of recursive domain equations. Okay, so that's it. And thank you very much. <laughs>